you. Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm John Underwood. I'm the EMS Medical Director at Swedish American EMS System. Uh, good morning, I'm Greg Conrad, EMS Medical Director at KISH. Hi, I'm Tony Winston. I'm the EMS System Coordinator at KISH Waukee and Kill. I'm Mark Owecki. I am an EMS Educator with OSF in Rockford. Richard Robinson, I'm the EMS System Coordinator at Swedish American. Dr. Kirk Schubert, I'm the Clinical Pharmacist in Emergency Medicine at Swedish American Hospital, and I also sit on the EMS board. I'm Kat Lewis, I'm the Application Analyst at Swedish American Hospital. Just quickly, what's in, what's, what's out, what's out. Okay. So the first thing we'll go over is when we rewrote this, what left? Because there are a number of protocols that are not there anymore. Um, cardiac arrest overview, dysrhythmia overview, extremity trauma, load and go, pediatric trauma, PVCs, renal emergencies, return of spontaneous circulation, SARS, chest and abdominal trauma, head and facial trauma, neck and spinal cord trauma. Um, while they're gone, they're not really gone, they're rolled into other protocols. Um, procedures that aren't, will not be used anymore, AV fistula graph access, um, CO oximetry, combi tubes, defibrillation, King's airway, latex precautions, nebulizer inhal or inhalation administration, and saline locks. Before you get real concerned, King Airways didn't go away. It's just a new term, superglottic airway. So it, it covers more things. The things that we updated and renamed is ambulance diversion status, automatic implantable wearable cardiac devices, um, delayed sequence airway management innovation, which is DSI, the inbound radio report and alert notifications, intranasal medications, the MAD device, there are new meds and there's some that won't be used that way anymore. Uh, refusal of medical care and transport is a new form. Shock hemorrhage, fluid resuscitation, substance abuse related emergencies, alcohol substance abuse, adult toxic exposure, formerly was poisoning and overdose, and then there's a new transport template, um, formerly for the closest hospital, to give you more information about where you're transporting to and how to make those decisions. New SMOs completely are capnography, crush syndrome, suspension trauma, pediatric airway management, request for new region one SMOs, procedure for medication or procedure or medication, routine pediatric care, sepsis, special needs patients, the transport template, the medication administration chart, which we'll be going over later, the new formulary, um, the standard dosing charts for ILS, ALS, BLS only and EMR only, and then medication shortages. Starts off with routine medical care. A lot of those things that aren't there anymore went into the routine stuff because what everything starts with is your basic medical call, right? When you get out there, this is where you're gonna begin. All your O2 guidelines, 12 lead guidelines, entitled CO2, IV guidelines, and yes, nausea and vomiting can be covered under routine medical care because we do that quite a bit. So we added all that into the routine system so you don't have to have separate protocols for that. When you look into routine medical care, it's gonna start giving you direction on what you're gonna do on your calls. When you get down to oxygen administration, the biggest thing anymore, it used to be all the time, let's give everybody oxygen. We don't need to do that anymore. The research is really showing we wanna keep them between 94 and 99 percent. If they're already sat in there, we might not need to give them supplemental oxygen. So you have a little more direction on what to do with that. In title CO2, you're gonna hear a lot more about when we get into the protocol, but that is the best way to monitor our good airway situation and how they're perfusing. So it really should be used a great deal. When you look through these, when you see yellow, that's eye level stuff, I or P. When you see pink, that's paramedic. So we split it up so it's all listed in one protocol, but you have the option of seeing what goes forward. So your fluid or your fluid bowls is in there. When you look down for IV, or IV needs, when you look at what things we would like two IVs for, you're, it's pretty clear as to what those things are. Your GI bleeds, your stroke, your STEMI, your unstable vitals, your sepsis patients. They're all pretty sick people. It's nice if we get two IVs. If we could only get one, that's okay, but we'd prefer to get two. Um, so make sure you're looking through that. But this gives you all your guidelines on your routine medical care. Routine pediatrics, same principle. Um, when you look through routine pediatrics, a lot of it comes into your approach, depending on the age of that child. How you approach them is going to say a lot, but we really want to look real closely at breathing and airway because mainly in peds, our biggest problem is going to be an airway issue or a breathing issue. Let's turn those around first. Um, circulation, your disability, exposure, um, special health care needs, Glasgow Coma Scale, normal vitals, and a dehydration system. In that 
protocol, there are charts for those. The normal vital signs are in there. The nice part about the electronic version, I can get to things fairly quickly by accessing the quick links. I can find out what my normal vitals are. Let's face it, 10% probably of our, of our transports are pediatrics. We might not be as good as those as we do with our adults. We just don't see them as much. So referring back to that and getting your normal vital signs can help you out. But same thing with dehydration. You got to remember, they dehydrate really quick. They don't have the stores that we have as an adult. So take that scale and start looking. What's the level of dehydration I'm dealing with? How much fluid should I be giving this kid? Routine trauma, same thing. It's not changed a great deal other than a lot of the separate protocols are rolled into routine trauma because it's just the treatment we've always been doing. Your guidelines for needle decompression are there, hemorrhage control, your IV access, your track treatment. Make sure you're checking blood sugars if they're altered. We want to make sure they didn't have a wreck because their blood sugar was low, so make sure we're always doing that. Pelvic binders, um, if you have you know, isolated head trauma, you want to get that head up a little bit, and then splint and bandage. When you get into the protocol itself, you'll see how your protocol is laid out. You're still going through your ABCs just like we always did. You get down to your chest, you're looking for your needle decompression as an eye or above level. Your fluid access, getting your access in and giving the fluid bolus is indicated. Assessment wise, making sure that we're taking a look at all those injuries. In the winter, sometimes we don't want to get them uncovered, but sometimes we have to. If they have serious injuries, we've got to find out what it is so we can address the injuries. Watching their airway status. Again, entitled CO2 gives you a lot of information. Using it on these people can tell you a lot of information as far as how your patient's doing, so looking for that. And then applying your pelvic binder as needed. When we get into 12 leads, one of the biggest changes is that BLS providers will be able to perform and transmit 12 leads. They do not have to interpret. I's and P's have to interpret. Now as a BLS provider, if they see a printout on that EKG that says acute STEMI, they should be looking towards their hospital going, we have a STEMI. They should be transmitting if possible. The emphasis is getting that alert out quickly. That's how we get the cath lab activation in a, in a timely manner and we decrease those door to balloon times which helps save those hearts. Um, there's also information on right-sided MIs. I know in our system we've been talking about that. I've been getting questions about that. I've told them in the new protocols that is addressed more deeply than it ever has been. And then also on posterior 12 leads. We have charts in there that shows you application of all lead, different leads. If I'm doing a right-sided, if I'm doing a posterior, where to move my leads around so we get the same picture every time. Acute abdominal pain. There's not a lot of change in the protocol from what it was before, other than the format's a little bit different with the one color-coded issue. Um, don't forget to consider a 12 lead on my abdominal pain people. People with epigastric pain, that could be cardiac, not abdominal. So make sure you think about that. And then of course, treating the, the nausea and vomiting. And guess what? You no longer have to ask for pain control for your abdominal pain people. They're in pain. Use the pain management protocol to treat them appropriately. Abuse, domestic, and geriatric, other than the format, the biggest change in there is we update all the phone numbers. All those things that you have to call in and access now have current phone numbers, so you get the right phone number to report these issues. That's the biggest change in that. Um, sometimes it was hard to find phone numbers in the past. We went through that and helped updated that for you. When we get into airway management, the format changed. The biggest thing is we want to really think about, this is really airway management, not just sticking a tube in anybody that needs it, manage the actual airway. There are other ways sometimes to do that. The new O2 standards are in there, of course CPAP's there. Um, you see NG tube for gastric decompression. If you tube somebody, you will have the ability with training of putting that NG tube down to decompress that stomach to decrease that vomiting aspect. Superglottic airways, of course, took the, took the place of King Airway specifically because we're gonna have pediatric sizes. They make pediatric King Airways now, we're gonna start using those because in pediatric airway, Innovation's not preferred anymore, and in fact, we took it out of the protocol for under 30 kilograms, because if you look at the, all the recent data, it's not a skill we do very often, so we have a lot of problems with that. We have better ways to manage that pediatric airway. We do it with, with superglottics. Normal entitled CO2s are added. Um, confirm your airway placement. We want, definitely want advanced airways with a minimum of three confirmation methods. The most preferred is entitled CO2. 
And tidal CO2 gives us the best information on not only is it placed in the right spot, but is it effective? We want to be able to monitor that. So presence and monitoring is the best thing. Format changes were all for alcohol substance abuse, altered mental status, diversion status for the hospitals, and amputated parts. It's just a matter of rolling those protocols into that yellow and pink format. Adult anaphylaxis and allergic reaction, though, is where we start to come into one of the new medications you're going to see. Methylprednisolone um, has been added for moderate and severe reactions. It's a corticosteroid, helps reduce that inflammation to help those people out a little bit. So when you look in the protocol itself, it's split up by mild, moderate, and severe. In mild, you're only really giving them probably a little bit of Benadryl. When we start to get into the moderate aspect and they're a little bit worse, you're doing your routine medical care. You're starting with your albuterol, your duonub. If you do a duonub, make sure your follow-ups are albuterol only. Duonub's the one-time drug, so do it one time and then go. My IV access, I can give them some diphenhydramine. If you think they're serious, you can contact medical control for epinephrine um, and then your methylprednisolone and transport. When we go to severe, now your epi's moved up a little bit because your patient's a whole lot worse. So we might need to give them something quickly to open that airway up and move forward. But after that, we're starting to do that same kind of thing. Get your IV in. And when you look at the fact that, oh, we can give it IV, we can. Think about your patient. You have to get your IV started in order to do that. So IM might be your best access just because you can get it quicker. It might not, you might not want to wait long to get that IV in in order to start that in. If I can give a quick injection, start to turn them around and then work towards the, the patient getting better. Adult asystole and PEA, you see another new medication. Calcium gluconate, if you have a patient, you go, to the, you go to the dialysis center, you have a renal failure patient, we're pretty sure that their potassium's probably elevated. So you're gonna start considering maybe we should give them calcium gluconate. Um, that comes up when we get into the protocol. So if you're, you know, when you, you get your history on your patient, you got a dialysis patient, you got a renal failure patient, you have somebody that you know ingested potassium, start thinking maybe we give them some medication for that. Implantable and wearable cardiac devices used to be easy. All we really talked about was ICDs and pacemakers. There's a couple more things now. We have life vests. We have ventricular access devices. We see these in the community quite a bit, especially uh, life vests are become much more prevalent because it takes usually two to three months before somebody gets their pacemaker put in. So we got to make sure that we're looking and knowing what that thing's going to do. Now we can go. So my ICD patient, you can still use your cardiac monitor. You can treat your dysrhythmias as you could. You don't want to place your defib pads right over it. Um, the big thing is if they're saying it's malfunctioning, get them on a cardiac monitor because they're going to, they're going to feel the shock. Unfortunately, sometimes they're feeling shock because they're going into VTAC and it's doing what it's supposed to do. Make sure it's just malfunctioning and they're performing in a regular rhythm and not that it's actually doing the treatment it's supposed to do because that's a different thing. When we get into our life vest, these people that are wearing that, the, the thing with a life vest is, the nice part is it's got a voice activation. It's going to tell you what it's going to do. It's going to warn you before it shocks them. Because if you're touching them, you're going to get it too. So listen to the prompts. If it tells you to clear, you want to clear. If you look at the patient and that vest has blue stains, it has delivered a shock to them. If you have to use your defibrillator on them, you can take the battery out of the life vest disable it so it's not going to go off in a, you know, at the wrong time. Throw your defibrillator on and treat as you normally would. Pacemakers, no difference than before. You'll see your pacer spike. Um, it's just a matter of where I put my defib pads. Don't stuck one right over the machine. It's not going to work effectively there and it's going to damage it, so put them in another place. And then our ventricular access devices. The biggest thing there is they're all going to have a number for their implant coordinator. That's the important number to know. The other people that are the resource for you is the family because before these people are sent home, they've been thoroughly educated on that device. They know exactly how it works. They know exactly who to call because they've, been, they've dealt with this. The things you gotta remember is because that's a continuous pump, they might not have a pulse. I can grab their wrist and I won't feel nothing. You might not be able to get a blood pressure on them. Your pulse ox might not work. 
Well, how do we know how it's working? Because they're talking to you, they're mentating well, and their color's decent. That's blood flow. Um, the big thing is it's got two alerts. A yellow is an advisory, a red's a critical. We just got notified of one the other day that actually tells us he can have compressions. Some of them can't if they actually don't work. And he can be defibrillated if need be. Those coordinators are going to give you that information. They know because there's some, some of these devices, you can't do chest compressions on these people. So you really got to know when you're dealing with this device, is it one I can do that with or not? Behavioral emergencies, um, we just changed the format. The rest of the protocol is the same. Bite, stings, and envenomation. Um, you're looking at your routine medical. If you think it's an allergic reaction, start treating the allergic reaction. Um, get your fluid bolus going if they're hypotensive. We can't turn the fluid around. The fluid's not doing it. It's time to hang dopamine. Nice part about dopamine now is we have a beautiful chart that's nice and color coded, makes it much easier for people. You don't have to figure out the dose on your own. Guesstimate the weight, look it up, you got your dose. Also for body substance exposure and body substance isolation, your universal precautions, it's just format changes, nothing else really changed in the protocol. When we get to adult symptomatic bradycardia, um, we replaced don't, or call medical control for atropine with Caution should be used with atropine. If I have somebody with a STEMI, inferior wall MI, left bundle branch block, and their heart rate's low, if I give them atropine, what's going to happen? I'm going to speed it up. That's probably going to accelerate the damage to my heart. So we might be, you want to be real careful with that on how we're treating them. How are they, you know, is it somebody serious enough that I really have to speed it up, or can we get them where we need to get them? Bronchospasm. Um, again, you'll see another new medication, mag sulfate, and your methylprednisolone. So we're going to use medications for this to decrease those, um, decrease the muscles and decrease the inflammation on top of using your albuterol and your duonebs. Another avenue to try to help these people out, of course, being not being able to breathe is one of the scariest things you're ever going to consider. Adult burns. Um, format changes, big thing with burns is fluid resuscitation. The burn formula is in there. Take a look. We're not asking you to be exact, but you got to get, get the fluid in when you should. Capnography is a new SMO. It's a skill for all levels. Entitled CO2 itself is a result of metabolism, perfusion, and ventilation. All of our advanced airway people, we should be monitoring entitled CO2. In the protocol, we put information on the waveforms, how to read the waveforms. We also put some examples of what some of the abnormal waveforms will look like, so you have a clue of what you're looking for. If you're not familiar with it in your system, talk to one of your educators, talk to your coordinator, get more training on it, because this is a tool that gives us a lot of information, but we gotta use it more than we do to get that information. It really helps us out. In carbon monoxide, we did add the carboxyhemoglobin chart. The interesting thing about that is when you look at it and you start looking at who needs treatment and what level they're at, don't get too hung up on what level they're at and say, well, they must be this because I'm getting these symptoms. Not necessarily. Smokers might have a level of about 10 when they're sitting here. And if we look at this, 10 is going to be who mild headache, shortness of breath with vigorous exertion. Oh, they need to be on 100% oxygen. Most of our smokers don't need 100% oxygen. So it's a reference guide for you. It might help you in certain situations, but it's just an estimate. Cardiogenic shock, there's that nice dopamine chart I was talking about. Works well, I get my weight, I go over and find out how many drops per minute I gotta use. I go down, I figure it out. Yes, you don't carry pumps, so you're gonna have to guesstimate drops. I say guesstimate because I know they're on down the ambulance. It's really hard when the bumps head are going to be there. You've got to be close. Dopamine's not made to be run wide open. So make sure you're getting a good estimate of where it is. When we get to cardio version, again, it was just a format change. This is an ILS or ALS skill. So it's a matter of still treating those rhythms appropriately when we have to, following the ACLS guidelines. Central line and imported port access, implanted port access, I guess that should say. I guess I missed that one too. Um, ALS skill, got to have the proper equipment. You also got to have the proper training. 
So again, if this is something you're going to be doing, if you haven't been trained in it by your system, contact your system to get extra training. We did take the AV fistula graft vascular access out. Um, we probably shouldn't be trying to access anybody's fistula. Chest pain is suspected cardiac origin. Uh, while we changed the format, one of the big things is that early 12 lead. The optimum time for your 12 lead on these people is within 10 minutes of you getting to the patient. Now we all know that there are times that's not going to be possible, depending on the situation. We want it as quick as you can so we can get activation, right? Basics can now carry their own nitro. It used to be where a basic could give a patient's nitro to them, but now basics will be able to carry their own nitro. If the patient has a nitro prescription of their own, you're able to give the first dose of yours offline. If the patient has never had nitro, you still got to call before you give it to them. When we look at inferior wall MIs, you got to consider your fluid bolus. The other thing you got to consider is doing a right-sided 12 lead. So if I come up and I'm reading my EKG and I see an inferior wall, the big thing is about 40% of inferior walls have some right-sided involvement. If I do a right-sided 12 lead and I see some right-sided involvement, I don't want to give them nitro at all because I might dump their pressure and not get it back. So it's a new thing for us. It's something that's probably got to take a little getting used to, but it's something we got to look more into. Um, the other new medication, metoprolol. So I have a STEMI patient. If their heart rate's over 100, or their systolic's over 160, or their diastolic's over 100, I might be giving them metoprolol. The thing with metoprolol is it's given over five minutes. It's not the EMS thing of, oh, we just gave them their medication. It's really five minutes, guys. You're going to have to look at that. It's going to take some getting used to to give those meds slowly because you got to be able to do it. When we look through the protocol, again, 12 lead access. Um, the nitro by EMTs is all listed out, getting your IV started, and then progressing through the medications as directed. And then we get down to our metoprolol dose. And again, the nice part about the protocols is in the electronic format, I touch, I touch metoprolol, takes me right to it, tells me my dose, tells me, tells me my contraindications, tells me that time frame, gives me that information really quickly. And then if they're hypotensive, fluid boluses, and or dopamine. Format changes for child abuse, neglect, childbirth, concealed carry, which was already a newer protocol anyway, and then CPAP. Crush syndrome and suspension trauma is a new one. I know from our full-time fire guys on our side, this is something they've been working on. The suspension trauma is something they've been doing more and more with. Um, crush syndrome we've seen for a while, but suspension we didn't think about near as much. One of the big things with this stuff is if we're suspecting hyperkalemia, we might be giving calcium gluconate. So if I have somebody trapped for a long time for my crush syndrome, significant wait for usually over four hours. Now we know that as that happens, cells are being killed. They've got all this tamping out and off. The other thing you got to think about, when I release that weight, if they have an open wound, it could bleed heavily. So sometimes I want to try to put tourniquets in place before I ever do it. They might not be tightened, but they're ready. So just in case when we release that weight and they bleed heavily, we can throw our tourniquet down. Suspension trauma, the biggest thing is once they come down, we can't lay them flat. They have to be in a sitting position for at least 30 minutes. So you got to look at what you're going to do in these situations and how we're going to treat it. So we start off with our routine trauma care. Spinal restriction as directed, and then for suspension or crush, it gives us direction as to what we're going to do. We want a cardiac monitor on them. We're going to use our pain management SMOs. We're going to get our IV started as best we can. If we're thinking hyperkalemia, not only calcium gluconate, but albuterol. We want to help that drive that potassium out. That brings us to delayed sequence innovation or management, DSI. This is a new SMO. The big thing is that highlighted portion is the thing we got to really notice. It's only to be used by approved providers. Each system is going to have criteria of what that means. So you really are going to have to work with your medical director and your EMS system to figure out how that's going to work on your system. Um, we do have the medications that we've added for induction and for paralytics. Again, if you're doing it, you're going to know that you're approved for it. Because if nobody's ever told you you are, you're not. That's how easy it is to remember. 
and each system medical coordinator or medical director will be making those decisions on how that's going to work. If you're doing this, it'll be advanced training. Got to be real good at your airway stuff. If we're going to give people medications and knock them out and paralyze them, we want to make sure you're real good at putting tubes in. That's it for me. Is there anything you want to add about the DNA side? Um, and I, I guess not particularly. The, the, the emphasis on all of these is going to be to manage the airway, you know, whether that's with uh, an oral pharyngeal airway and an ambu mask or, mask or a king's airway or an endotracheal tube. The key is you want to manage the airway. Definitely. And I just want to touch on the metoprolol. If you have a person with chest pain, ST changes, and you suspect cocaine, do not give it or call medical control. Excellent point. Yep. <laughs> Excellent point. Yeah. Cocaine and metoprolol right do not mix. 